law, Mr. Takagi did not see it that way, so he won't be joining us for the rest of his life. It's a movie set at Christmas, but it's not a Christmas movie. Some people say it's a Christmas movie, but it's not a Christmas movie, just a movie set at Christmas. If this is a Christmas movie, then so is Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Oh, screw it. It's a Christmas movie. Die hard. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Six or more armed with automatic weapons at Nakatomi Plaza, Century City. Sometimes a movie comes out of nowhere and totally redefines its genre. Die Hard is a film where some terrorists take over a building and it's up to one person to put things right. Die Hard was not only a successful action movie but became a template for lots of action movies for years to come. It became a shorthand for any action film taking place in a single location. Speed was Die Hard on a bus. There were dozens of Die Hard on a plane films and of course Under Siege was Die Hard starring a block of really dumb wood. New York cop John McClane is estranged from his wife Holly, who's moved out west for a high-powered job. He's been invited to his wife's fancy offices in Nakatomi Plaza in downtown Los Angeles for the office Christmas party. And if there's ever been a driver for the breakup of marriages, it's having to attend a social event at your partner's place of work. We meet Holly's boss, Mr. Takagi, and her colleague, Ellis, all-star pro douchebag and winner of the Douche Bowl three years running. Then, just as the party's really kicking off and Ellis outlines his Christmas Eve plans to sand back his kitchen floors, retile the bathroom and paint his apartment as well as everybody else's apartment in his building, a group of Grinches show up to steal Christmas. Or murder people, I forget which. They are an assortment of what Americans like to describe as Eurotrash, though they're mostly German sounding, led by the oily Hans Gruber, an evil murderer who is still somehow one of the most likable people in this movie. Sorry, Ellis. <laughs> Carl, hunt that little shit down and get those detonators. What follows is a shoeless John McClane sneaking around several floors still under construction while whittling away at the terrorists, just as one would cross people off their Christmas list while shopping for gifts. Santa, John McClane, the angel of death, gives the gift of bullets in the groin. One of Die Hard's gifts to the action genre, the party line. McClane and Gruber taunt each other over the radio while John has a friend on the outside in the form of soon-to-be clocking off cop Al Powell. Al is a desk jockey these days because he shot a kid. Did I do that? Hans Gruber and co aren't really terrorists because this is more of a heist of $600 million worth of bonds in a vault. He has various accomplices, Carl, Fritz, Marco, Franco, Uli and others. All have their role, but it's their tech guy Theo as the second most obnoxious person in the film. Sorry, Ellis. The LAPD weigh in and screw things up, and then the FBI show up and make things even worse. I'm Agent Johnson. This is Special Agent Johnson. Oh, how you doing? No relation. None of the outside help has done anything but make John McClane's job harder. A chance encounter with Hans Gruber pretending to be a hostage lets us see the pair face off against each other. Now to use a handgun, Bill. You know that game with the guns that shoot red paint? Another wrinkle in the film is the ruthless reporter Richard Thornton, whose desire for a scoop outs Holly as John's wife. And for some reason, limo driver Argyle sits in the basement parking lot for the entire film until the script finally finds something for him to do. Might you have to nuke the whole building, Hans? Well, when you steal $600, you can just disappear. When you steal $600 million, they will find you. Of course, John McClane is going to best the terrorists. Was there any doubt? Also, was there any doubt that the guy you thought was previously dead comes back briefly at the end, only to be dead again? Now, that was an incredibly fun movie. Well, go on, show him. What, are you embarrassed? It's just a small token of appreciation for all our hard work. It's a Rolex. In the 1980s, action movies had become really big business. And unlike previous decades, action movies didn't have to be westerns, war movies, or spy films. 80s action films often revolved around a single character, occasionally with an offsider. Often they were about a cop, but sometimes they featured a talented civilian who was somehow also a Green Beret or Delta Force operative in a previous life. And unlike previous decades, action films of the 80s found a sense of humor. And depending on who wrote the film, you either have characters with acidic tongues making off-color jokes straight out of a Bond film, or incredibly obnoxious characters. Case in point, practically everybody in a Lethal Weapon movie. You're here in a hostile takeover. You grab us for some green mail, but you didn't expect some poison pill was going to be running around in the building. Am I right? Die Hard manages to give us some odious types, but ones who don't make you want to plug up your ears with epoxy resin in order to block out the appalling dialogue. yippee ki -yay. Motherfucker. 
Die Hard started off as a property that's basically a cascade of one property inspiring another, which inspired another, which inspired another. Crime writer Roderick Thorpe had a novel called The Detective, published in 1966, which was quickly adapted into a hit film starring Frank Sinatra. Years later, Thorpe had an idea inspired by the disaster movie The Towering Inferno about the takeover of a building, and wrote a sequel to his earlier novel called Nothing Lasts Forever, which was published in 1979. Years later, screenwriter Jeb Stewart took a job adapting Thorpe's novel for 20th Century Fox. He lightened the story up considerably in the process. Stephen E. D'Souza, writer of many things in the 80s, but probably best known as the director of the early 90s Street Fighter movie, came in to rewrite Stewart's script. Director John McTiernan had just made the film Predator. You son of a bitch. <laughs> which made him a likely suspect to direct any big budget action film. They had a script, they had a director, now they needed a lead. Sister Teresa called me Mr. McLean in the third grade. My friends call me John. You're neither shithead. Even though he was never seriously considered for the role, producers had a contractual obligation to offer the gig to Frank Sinatra. Now I just have to get the image out of my head of Frank Sinatra saying some of Willis's lines like, yippee ki -yay, mother f Who are you then? Flying in the ointment, Hans. The monkey in the wrench. The pain in the ass. Lots of actors were considered or approached for the lead role, but Bruce Willis was a wildcard entry, having only made one middlingly successful movie, and was at the time starring in the TV series Moonlighting. Scheduling with the hit show made it impossible for him to do the film, until his co-star's sudden pregnancy put the show on early hiatus, freeing up Willis to take on what would become his most iconic role. There's no linkage and no DNA tests are necessary. Most babies are born bald, so that's proof of nothing. Baby, come on. The in the movie, Willis is an everyman, while also being a weary New York cop who's hoping he can patch things up with his wife. He's also not above putting himself in harm's way to get the job done. While Bruce Willis became a huge star as a result of Die Hard, everybody remembers Alan Rickman's most perfect villain ever. From the snarky looks to the perfect diction and charming menace, Rickman's portrayal of Gruber cemented the actor as a movie antagonist for years. Whether it be Harry Potter, Love Actually, or just for shits and giggles, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Because I am interested in the $640 million in negotiable bearer bonds that you have locked in your vault. Bonnie Bedelia as Holly is also re-evaluating her separation with John, with the slight hope the pair can reconcile. What idiot put you in charge? You did. When you murdered my boss. She stands up to Gruber without flinching and gets the final word with dickhead Thornton. Reginald Vell Johnson was soon to become a major sitcom star in the 90s, but here he balances the joviality and pathos in his exchanges with John McClane. You know, when you're a rookie, they can teach you everything about being a cop except how to live with a mistake. While Rickman and Willis put in career-defining performances, everyone knows the true star of Die Hard is Hart Bochner as Ellis. And that just ain't gonna happen until you stop messing up the works, capiche? A few years earlier, he was Supergirl's love interest, and here he's giving us one of the most 80s dickhead business types we've ever seen. Ellis is a combination of roguish charm, smarminess, and the quintessential douchebag side character. A douchebag's douchebag, in fact. He's so douchey, he's the monogrammed leather carrying case the douchebag came in. When Ellis steps in to try and negotiate a way out, you know what's going to happen, but you hate to see him off since he steals almost every scene he's in. But Rickman brooks no ham but his own. Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. Of course, with Ellis killed off screen, there's always a chance he'd be back. Uh, but no, he's dead. One thing Die Hard showed us that you needed to have your hero interact with the villain in some way throughout the movie. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is a great movie, but Kirk and Khan only ever interact over communicators and never face to face. It didn't matter because it was a great film. Here we have a continuation of that with the hero in contact with others but still isolated. With Die Hard being so influential, every action movie after this would take note. From the 90s onward there would be a slew of movie villains taunting their hero from afar through a variety of communications devices, from walkie-talkies, CB radios, telephones, etc. Once mobile phones became more and more popular, forget about it. No more of this waiting by a payphone shit. There has been a perennial debate about whether Die Hard is the best Christmas movie, the best movie to watch around Christmas, or whether it's even a Christmas movie at all. Ho, ho, ho.
Yes, it's set at Christmas. The whole plot kicks off at an office Christmas party. But that's really it. The first lethal weapon is also set at Christmas time, but that's not really mentioned as a Christmas movie. So is Iron Man 3, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and writer-director Shane Black set a lot of his films at Christmas, but none of them are considered Christmas movies. Die Hard gets the Christmas movie moniker, maybe because it's an easy film to rewatch, and also it does mean that's two hours of your life not dominated by listening to Mariah Carey singing All I Want For Christmas, or watching Love Actually, where someone else is singing All I Want For Christmas. Eyes on suspect, take the shot, take the shot. So is it a Christmas movie? Yeah, sure, why not? A side effect of Die Hard being accepted as a Christmas movie, people will watch it at Christmas every year. They will stream it, rent it, or buy it, which means it keeps making more money. Even Block of Really Dumb Wood got in on the act and made a Christmas movie. There's a cottage industry of films that didn't do amazing business on the original release, but because they're Christmas movies, they're trotted out every year. Like Mariah Carey exiting hibernation for six weeks every year to bask in people playing All I Want for Christmas before re-entering stasis until next year. Only John can drive somebody that crazy. Die Hard was a big success on its release in 1988, elevating the careers of several of its key players. Director John McTiernan would go on to make some good films and some less good films, ending up not just in cinematic jail, but in actual jail for a short spell. If you said his name backwards three times, Alan Rickman would appear in your film to sneer the place up. Director of photography Jan de Bont would also become a director himself, where he helmed the 90s hit Speed. Die Hard, of course, took Bruce Willis, then known as a fast-talking funny man on the TV detective series Moonlighting, and minted him as Bruce Willis' movie star. Oh, well, well. But a movie star who would make questionable role choices in trying to follow up Die Hard in any film that wasn't an actual Die Hard sequel. Things like Talking Babies and lesser action films before he finally found a groove in the mid-90s. There would eventually be more Die Hard films, then they'd stop for a very long time, and then they made a few more. They are mostly entertaining, but with each successive installment, they'd burn a little less brightly. Like using sparkling mineral water as an accelerant for a half-hearted insurance scam. And Die Hard has joined the ranks of those films that instantly spring to mind when you are asked about your favourite action movies or your favourite movies of the 1980s. Die Hard, or as Hans Gruber would know it, The Hard, is a well-made film with beautiful visuals, great action, good acting, and actual characters who veer between realistic and caricature yet still feel believable. There's just this fascination with the movie that other similar movies can't compete with. Did they really let a reluctant Alan Rickman fall just a bit sooner than he was expected when filming Hans Gruber's last moments? Did Bruce Willis really step on glass? And is Ellis the coolest douchebag in cinema history? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. And before we go, yippee ki mother